Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your girl, Jessie Mae Beluso. How you doing? How you living? How you learning? Are you loving? I'm so excited you're here. This is another Dr. Peluso episode. We had a bunch of questions to catch up on. This one is capturing the latest and the greatest questions that you guys submitted. And if you'd like to submit them, we're going to start doing weekend questions as well as Monday. Um, it just it seems to be a good day to do that. So we're, we're giving you two chances to submit questions on Saturdays and Mondays on my Instagram page to have your question possibly featured on the podcast. And if you'd like to watch this week's episode, you just have to go over to my YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash Jessie Mae Peluso and click subscribe and like all the videos there and share them with your friends. I'm very happy to say that this week's podcast episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Has there been something that has interfered with your happiness or something that's prevented you from achieving your goals? I know I've experienced that and I know I've been very vocal about it on this podcast. Losing my dad and losing my mom and going through the trauma of both of those experiences and the weight of grief was really heavy for me to carry alone. And I honestly, to be completely vulnerable and upfront, wish I had reached out to BetterHelp. BetterHelp can assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you'll be matched with that therapist in under 48 hours. That's quick. That's quicker than some of my my Bumble swipe matches. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional therapy done securely online. And there's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. And this service is available for clients worldwide. That's right, all over the world. Watch out, Mr. Worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. You won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you do with traditional therapy. That's the best. I can stay in my sweatpants. You know how it can be so depressing to have to dress up to go and break yourself down in front of a therapist? <laughs> it's like, I put lipstick on for this. I just want to stay in my house in sweatpants and have somebody help me, please. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. That's huge to have that accessibility and to be able to be choosing somebody that works for you. And if it doesn't work, you can switch it up. So I think that's a, a really cool feature. It's more affordable than traditional online therapy and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. And so do I, because you deserve it. BetterHelp.com forward slash sharp is where you're going to want to go. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And for you guys listening, my very special Sharp Tongers, we're offering you guys 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com forward slash sharp. Only for you guys. Thank you guys so much and thank you BetterHelp. And yeah, I, I might actually have to use my own promo code for myself. <laughs> Speaking of better help, that brings me to this week's podcast guest, the board uncertified with a PhD and THC, the one, the only, here to give you some better help, Dr. Peluso. <laughs> Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, 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 beep. You're beep. listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse May Jessie. Peluso. It's a personal look. Well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary, a deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's going to get dirty. You might cry. You'll probably laugh. Hopefully, you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss comedy, how hard it is to make it in this biz. I'm a fucking professional. Each week it's something different. Sometimes I have a guest host. Sometimes it's going to be a movie companion episode. Sometimes I just ramble about the bullshit I dealt with the week before. You never know what you're going to get. It's raw, uncut, and funny. It's me. Hey everybody. Welcome to another installment of The Doctor. Right here. If you don't have any health insurance, that's okay. I've got you. This is a doctor-based episode where all my information is totally experience-based. I don't have a degree. I don't claim to have a degree. 
I only claim to have experience I would love to share with you. And you guys keep coming, so I'm going to keep answering. That's the sound of a doctor taking sips. I also have my other medicine that I keep handy for inspiration for your answers. It's right here. Um, I've been sparking this puppy all day, so let's get into this. Tone Hero asks, which comedian inspired you to inspired you the most to do stand up and why? And what should I eat? Also, what should I eat? What should you eat? You should eat whatever fills your soul. You know, maybe check into your blood type diet. Maybe see what sort of predispositions you have. Are you prone to weight gain? Sugar is always a uh, culprit for a lot of issues in our American diet. But as far as like what you should eat, life is short. And, and I guess there is something to balance, although I'm a little bit more of a strict eater just because your girl gets chimples if she goes off her regimen. And let me tell you, she went off her regimen this holiday season. I sure had some sweetness. And do I regret it? Mm, not completely. Only only partly. But, you know, what you, you are what you eat. So just think about that the next time you put something in your mouth. And I'm not even going to say anything sexual about that. Which comedian inspired you the most to do stand-up and why? Okay, Tone Hero. Um, so many comedians. So many comedians inspired me. When I was growing up, my father was really good friends with comedians in Syracuse, New York. He knew Mike Goss, who was a local guy who was also very close with Bobcat Goldthwait and Moody McCarthy, Nick Mara, Gomez Adams, all these guys that were kind of like local comedians in the area. Uh, Tom Anzalone, I think was another one. I might have the name wrong, but all these guys used to go out and do stand up, and then they'd come back and they'd all have breakfast together. And my dad, because he was a friend with one of them, would go as well and he'd bring me. So I'd go to these like Sunday breakfasts with these grown men who just were out on the road making money and coming back and being like, What is this life? You mean this is something that I can pursue myself? And I just was really intrigued by it as a as a young tot, you know, 16, 17 years old. And all these guys are just busting each other's balls. And I was just like, you left and made money and came back. Like, that sounds amazing. And you don't have a boss? Sign me the fuck up. So those guys inspired me initially, just knowing that it was something I could do. Because growing up in a town like Syracuse, New York, it wasn't like there was a huge cultural scene here. There wasn't like a huge arts and music and performance scene here. So that was my sort of first exposure to something that could be possible as a career. And it, it, it dug its hooks into me. But as far as like watching comedians growing up, my dad loved comedy. My father loved comedy. He's now since passed away you guys who know me and listen to this podcast regularly know that he died in 2018 but from a very young age he would expose me to comedy and that's a good thing because some kids you know their actual parents expose themselves so I feel like I made out pretty good in that scenario my dad exposed me to Richard Pryor and uh, Gene Wilder, even though Gene Wilder wasn't really a stand-up comedian he was a comedic actor who also performed in a couple movies with Richard Pryor. There was Stir Crazy, Hear, uh, See No Evil, Hear No Evil. Um, there was, I think there was like a Silver Streak was a movie that they did together as well. I loved those movies growing up. The Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder combo. Hear No Evil, See No Evil. It might be one of the funniest classics for me from back in the day. And we, my dad just loved comedies. You know, Blazing Saddles was one of his favorite movies. Young Frankenstein, he loved all the Pink Panthers. If you don't know Pink Panther with um, John Cleese, I believe it was, or J Cleason, and I got to Google this because my dad would be fucking rolling in his grave if he was in a grave. Uh, he is in a jar downstairs. <laughs> Isn't that just so fucked up? <laughs> John Cleese, yeah. Um, so my dad loved all those movies and we watched all those movies. And you know, as a kid, it's not necessarily the most appropriate, but I think it really helped develop my sense of humor. And I think I, I, you know, I've thought about this, like what makes you become who you are, like what in your chat, in your childhood, in your past um, occurred to make you develop the sort of set of skills that you have. You know, I'm like Liam Neeson over here. 
I have a certain set of skills and it's not going to be to find your lost daughter, but in a sense it will because I will make her laugh at her pain and she'll find herself through the healing of it. But I think my dad exposing me to these movies was definitely um, a, a ingredient in the recipe that became the reason why I do stand up. But I think even deeper, it was a way to connect with my dad. I think having him laugh was a language for us. Laughter became a, a way that we communicated. And, and so because of that, I sought it out everywhere because I could realize that this was a, a way to make a connection with human beings. I did it in school. I did it at home, on the playground, everywhere. It, it just was who I was. It was a part of my, it became a part of my chemistry and it became how I communicated. It was my language to the world. And, and my father was a huge inspiration in that and a huge part of that. So when I think of like the comedians who inspired me the most, it would have to be my dad, even though he wasn't a traditional comedian or a stand up or a performer. He just still was so funny. And he is the one, he is the conduit to it all for me. He was the vehicle to comedy. But Richard Pryor was, to me, just, you know, I've talked about this on other podcasts, maybe even this podcast where I talk about the spectrum of comedy. And this is just an opinion, but I think the spectrum of comedy sort of st starts or ends at prior and then starts or ends at, at at Seinfeld. Maybe we start at Seinfeld because he's quote unquote a clean comic and you you have a whole spectrum of comedy in between and you kind of have prior on the other end. And so everything else in between is what makes up the landscape of stand up comedy or comedy in general. That's just my opinion. As far as like the different styles of comedy, you go from super clean to a man setting himself on fire because he's on drugs and it, that neither is better or worse. They both have a place in the entertainment industry and, and they both have a place in the, the landscape of comedy, the genre of comedy. But Richard Pryor just, he was, he was raw. He was relatable. Not that I was doing cocaine. <laughs> it's like, what is an eight year old white girl from upstate New York have in common with Richard Pryor? Fire and cocaine. I just loved the way he performed. I loved it. I, it was electric. It was blood, sweat, and tears. When I think of like a rock and roll comedy, I think of, of Richard Pryor. He put his blood, sweat, and tears into his performances. What he experienced became his stand-up. You know, I think when you look at Seinfeld versus... Prior Seinfeld, I think, is somebody, and this is just an opinion, not that he's not funny, very talented. I think the difference is, is that Seinfeld figured out how to be funny and Richard Pryor just was funny. And, you know, intelligent people can figure out patterns and, and duplicate them and replicate them. So that's just my opinion on it. But I also love Joan Rivers. Like growing up, Joan Rivers was everything. And Golden Girls, there was, there was so much good programming growing up that even was on a, a repeat um, syndication for my generation. You know, Golden Girls was amazing and the Cosby show was awesome, even though Cosby's a fucking pervert now and we got to say goodbye to that. But there still were so many influential comedians and shows back then that were definitely influential into what essentially became my career and what I do for a living. But Joan Rivers specifically was so special because she was so uninhibited and uncensored and didn't give a fuck what anyone said. She didn't give a fuck about, you know, being canceled wasn't even on her radar. You, 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 if Joan Rivers were alive today, there'd be no way you could cancel her. She wouldn't give a fuck. And her, her fans were so loyal. You know, I saw her perform live in New York city I went with, I was with my ex, Giannis Pappas at the time. We went to go see her live. And she was even, I want to say in her 70s then, maybe, maybe a little bit younger. And her energy was uh, alarming. Her, her quickness and her, her quick wittedness and how sharp she was on stage was, it was so fucking inspiring. And it really made me realize like there is no, ageism doesn't exist only in your mind. And only believing other people telling you that your limits exist within a certain age 
only if you believe that is that true. People like her broke the mold, you know, and she gave me such something to strive for, really. And what she talked about, she just she went after everybody. She didn't give a fuck. And I and and probably some people you're listening like, oh well, well a lot of that was too harsh. Go listen to somebody else. There's somebody for everybody. If you don't like a comedian, don't cancel them. Just fucking find find your person. Go find do some more research. Don't be lazy. You know, there's there's somebody for everybody out there. And fucking Robin Williams. Can we talk about Robin Williams? What a fucking career. What a performer. Uh, he I think he was one of the greatest. I truly do. Because he could do it all. He could play any type of character. He could play an alien or a gay guy. And you'd believe that he was either an alien or a gay guy. He was pure magic. He was a grown man who somehow figured out the ability to maintain his childlike awe. And he put his everything into his performances. He is such a body of work that spans so many different genres of film and entertainment. And I don't know if there's been a performer like him to date that I can think of for myself. You know, as far as like being inspired, he just was such a, an enigma. He was such a force and he seemed just like he exuded pure joy. It didn't seem like it was an act, even though he was so good at acting. He was, I think he was able to tap into a part of himself that was pure and bring that through in each role you know, Patch Adams and Awakenings, Hook, Mrs. Doubtfire, The Birdcage, even Goodwill Hunting. I mean, you talk about somebody with more emotional range that made you believe it. I'm all ears. I'm all ears. Put it in the comments below. I, t tell me who you think uh, could hold a candle to Robin Williams throughout his entire career up into the end. And his stand-up was fantastic. Not only was he a great stand-up, he was a great actor. And, you know, I don't know if I'm a firm believer that you need to have, you need to have a, all this pain in order to be a decent performer or comedian. But I do know that the pain can be useful and the trauma can be useful. And I would imagine that Robin Williams had been through a lot, especially towards the end, what he was experiencing you know, and that can be used, you know, that pain can be turned into purpose. And for me, you guys know my story. You know what I've been through. If you haven't, you can dig through some episodes, some older episodes of the Sharp Tongue podcast, or you can go look at Ryan Sickler's The Honeydew. I'm on there a couple times and I lay it all out, what, what I've experienced and what's happened to me. And those things, they could either define me or armor me with with tools and a purpose and I, it's not that I consciously chose to manipulate these things that have been so traumatic to me into something useful and something that I can put out there I, I I think it happened purely out of survival especially at a young age you know I started doing stand-up at 19 five years ago thank you and I think because of what happened to me, I had a choice and maybe subconsciously I made the choice to not be a victim, but I did have a victim mentality for a long time. I'm taking sips of tea because I am still fighting. I'm not completely out of the woods as far as whatever fucking head cold I had. So I appreciate your patience with my sips and my sniffles. I, you know, I, what what, what I, my whole point is, is that I think you can either be a victim or you can figure out a way to turn your pain into purpose. And I don't, I think initially after things happened to me, I definitely was a victim and I had a victim's mentality because I didn't know how to heal. I didn't have the fucking tools and it was me against the world and me defending myself. And I constantly felt like I was in a place of defense and had to be defensive and say defensive things and be this tough person because I, I wasn't going to let anything else affect me. And then now that I'm on the other side of it, having lost both my parents and experiencing other traumatic things in my life, I'm so much more, I have a more level head on me about it now. I don't think that 
to, to use words <laughs> from Tony Robbins, life was happening to me and now it's happening for me. And I realized that. And I think I started to realize that even before meeting Tony and all of that, all the work I was doing on myself and going to therapy and starting to go inward more than outward. Um, I think I just found a way to have that be the fuel that makes me want to perform and share and express what I've been through. And hopefully somebody who's listening or who's, who goes to my shows can relate to some things. And it sucks because we're relating to trauma, but it's also dope because it's, it's manageable in the moment. It's digestible. It's hopefully just another brick in your healing wall, if you will, coming to see me and listening to my podcast. That's now that's my whole why I want to do it is just to share, just to share and to provide some entertainment and maybe some insight and, and not necessarily hope, but some tools, you know, fucking, I think that's, I think that's why I love doing the Dr. Bluso shit so much because it makes me feel like I'm able to use what's happened to me to hopefully help everybody out there who's either experienced it and want wanting to heal or maybe even teach some young girls some some fucking new tricks and not to become a trick that's my whole goal in life man that was off of one question okay <laughs> let's go to the real heim one do you think the media pushes fear yeah I think fear and sex are powerful tools in marketing and commercialism and in media. I think fear and sex are used hand in hand. I think they're used separately. I think fear is definitely uh, a tool that politicians and big corporations use to make people buy. I mean, look what happens when storms hit. Oh, there's going to be a storm. Everybody goes out and buys all the chicken broth that they can fit in their pantry. You know, I think... Fear is an interesting thing. It's it's so it's it's such a powerful tactic that has been used f since the beginning of time. This isn't a new thing. Corporations and people with money using fear to control people. This isn't a new situation. This isn't anything that you know is only being used by media and corporations. I think this is just because of social media things get blown out of proportion even even the usage of fear gets blown out of proportion uh, you know I, I think there's a fear of fear and you know what fucking was it was it uh jfk said we've got nothing to fear but fear itself well we've got one more thing to fear it's the fear of fearing for itself it's a fear of fear so you add that on top to whatever jfk said was it jfk well, now i gotta google it and see because i don't want to be wrong we can't be wrong here. We need a fact checker. Let's see. Fear quotes. It was JFK, right? I hope it was. You've got nothing to fear but fear itself. Let us negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. I'm trying. I'm giving you the, the, the best <laughs> JFK impression I can. Um, let's see. You guys are probably screaming at me. Nothing to fear see who said it but fear itself am i wrong probably i'm wrong oh i know it's from a movie it is from oh it's roosevelt not jfk fucking idiot it was an inaugural dress of roosevelt 1933 inaugural address ah well what do you want from me you know i don't know every single thing you've got but is that the is that the right impression you've got nothing to fear but fear itself <laughs> stop. I'll move on. I swear to God, I'll move on. I do think the media pushes fear. Absolutely. Of course they do. And you guys eat it up like it's a fucking ice cream. Stop eating fear up like it's an ice cream. Actually, you can eat it and then use it. Just don't let it use you. You know, there's so many quotes on Instagram about fear. Go Google them and, and post them on your wall. Don't believe everything you read and don't believe the hype. And it, that's why I, I hate to say it because you know, it's, I think people have drawn their own opinions and, and people are going fucking crazy, but that's why there's an importance in having podcasts like this in any podcast that you want to listen to like Joe Rogan's because 
there's nobody it's all self-controlled you don't have a big corporation you don't have like a lobbyist in your pocket these are coming from individuals and there's still a free space and free thinking so I think that that's an important medium to have to have available so that we can learn a bunch of different shit and, and for the most part this shit's entertainment Every, every, everything has to be fucking perfect and absolutely right all the time. I mean, give me a damn break. I just did a quote as JFK and it was Roosevelt. You know, someone's going to take that out of context and try and cancel me because I'm, she's too dumb. A woman shouldn't have a voice if she doesn't know a fucking difference between Roosevelt and JFK. Okay, let's go on. Luxurious Lenny. On a scale of one to delicious, how healthy is going down on your girl? Um, extremely delicious, very, very healthy. As long as she's healthy, you know, I don't know what's going on with your girl, but yeah, Conalingus is very healthy and it's, I think it's even more healthy if the girl knows how to get her own self off <laughs> from JFK to jerking off. This podcast covers an array of subjects <laughs> from Roosevelt to getting felt up. Here's a couple tips on how to survive your life with Dr. Beluso. I think that cunnilingus is an important thing. I think it's a fun experience. I think it's fucking fantastic. I think it's necessary. I think you guys should spend some time learning tricks. But none of that matters until a woman really knows how to please herself. So I implore the women, I've said this before, to explore. I implore you to explore you and figure out what makes you feel good and get in there and, and be a hoe for yourself. Truthfully, slut it up for yourself. Be your own slut and then you'll be ready to get out into the world and be other people's sluts. I think that's the healthiest way to do it. And I think it is healthy to go down on your girl. Heck yeah, bro. Are you kidding me? Especially if you get good at it, learn some tricks. Side note, you want a little, a little uh, pro tip? There is a guy called the Squirt Doctor on I, I don't know what porn site. He's I just found him and he's he look I would like to book an appointment. From one doctor to another, I would like to book an appointment with the Squirt Doctor. You know what to do, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> the Squirt Doctor is a man on the porn sites who shows men how to teach women, not teach women, but who shows men how to make girls squirt. And I've watched a couple of his videos and I have to say his technique is, it looks impeccable. That's all I'll say on that. But I will say going down, exploring each other, heck yeah. Life is too short. Explore, get down there, door the explorer up in your girl. Put on one of those hard hats, safari hats, and some cargo pants. Grab yourself a handful of pistachios and get in that pussy. Okay, Carmen San Diego. Okay, Magellan. Get down there and discover a new species. Hopefully not a creepy critter. Nobody wants a creepy critter in her coochie. <laughs> I just love the vastness of what I discuss. Uh, I entertain myself. At the very least, I entertain myself. Adam, a man, Adam, Adam, and to Samusi, uh, Adam, let's try this again. Adam, man, Adam, and to Smissy. I, your, your last name is, I don't know what it is. Adam. He says, how do I initiate a conversation with a woman online through DMs? When does one ask for nudes, if ever? I don't think you should ask for nudes until you've met somebody and there's been an actual physical chemical reaction between you two. I don't think you should ask for nudes until you're certain she wants to see you nude. I don't think you should ask for nudes until you have taken her out and treated her like a lady and confirmed that she is reciprocating the emotion and likeness as well. Don't lead with a dick pic. And there's some girls out there probably like, what? I love a dick pic. Well, bitch, if you get a dick pic, expect to get dicked over. Okay. And maybe that's not a consistent science, but in my mind, you know, you gotta, you gotta play with it a little bit. You got a cat and mouse, just a little bit, just, just a teeny bit in the sense that, you know, hold out, hold out a little, maintain the mystery. And as a dude, 
how do you initiate conversation through DMs? Maybe comment something on what she posted that isn't creepy. Make a comment and compliment her. Ask her a question. Find out what she likes and maybe ask her about it. Ask her about something she's into. You know, if she's into a cause, if you see on her page like myself, and I'm not inviting people to ask me about this. This is solely for an example. Because now that Jason Momoa is on the market, uh, you know, Bautista's got some competition. So I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to say this is how you should slide into my DMs because my DMs are pretty full right now. We're pretty stocked, locked and loaded. But if you want to slide into somebody's DMs like myself, you might say something like, I really respect your work with Alzheimer's awareness and what got you into that. Anyways, just stopping by to say hi. I think you're cool. Like what you do. Keep it short, sweet, complimentary, and inquisitive. And be yourself. Don't try too hard. I think when you try too hard, it just emanates. I can always try. I can always tell when someone's trying too hard. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I can tell. It, I, I, it's just it, it, you, you're better off looking like a fool being yourself than exhausting yourself trying to be someone else. I firmly believe that. So if you want to initiate conversation with the lady, slide in them DMs. Go ahead. But don't don't be asking for nudes. Okay. This is no, no, no nudes unless you know she wants to see you nude. That's the doctor's orders. Why does the universe exist? Damn. You guys are all over the spectrum. <sighs> I don't know if we're ever going to know a why. I don't think why is the right question. Not that it, there's a right or wrong way to inquire about something. But in my mind, it's like, how does the universe e exist? You know, how are we? I'm not so much obsessed with why are we as how are we? And maybe in the how, the answer to the how, we'll discover the why. And this is when the edible kicks in and you're like, oh, oh, oh. How are we? I get the I get the big bang. I understand the supernovas and the universe is constantly expanding and you know, your the light you're looking at is is a dead light and uh, light takes a long time to travel. All the all the crazy stuff. All the all the stuff that Neil deGrasse Tyson teaches. I'm into all that. I just it blows my mind to think about and and wonder about the universe because it's like is there an end? Like this room, there's walls. And on the outside of these walls is my sister's backyard. And I know that because I've been there. But the universe is so much harder to geomap in your mind. It's so much harder to comprehend because you don't understand where it ends because apparently it doesn't. Not only does it not end, but it's expanding. My question is, if, if it's expanding, what's it expanding into? Is it expanding into itself? So if there's a point where the universe is moving forward, where is it moving to and what was there before it moved into it? That's what I start to think about. Because when you think about expansion, you're going to be taking up more space. Well, what was in the space before? Oh, I can't. I can't do it because I did take an edible and it's starting to freak me out. <laughs> Look. I just picture, I just picture fucking... The never-ending story scene with the horse. <laughs> You've got to try. You've got to fight the nothing. It's like, is it nothing out there? Are we fighting the nothing? Is that what we're expanding into? What's nothing? That's a question. What's nothing? Because that's what we're fucking expanding into. Maybe the, the answer to why do we exist and why does the universe exist exists within the nothing and so we need to go to never-ending story to figure it out that's your answer buddy that's your answer um a couple of these may have been from previous a previous uh podcast that would be funny if i answered something twice differently which is possible because we do have moods don't we we definitely have moods um let's see uh oh so this was a question that I, somebody had asked and I was confused, so I wanted to readdress it. 
Paul Judge McGee asked recommendations for processing loved ones or childhood heroes. Because last time we were talking, um, Bob Saget had died. And I didn't really get into it too much. Um, I was sad about that. And I think it is a good conversation to have about processing the loss of childhood heroes. I, I feel the same about even people like Bill Cosby. Even though he's not dead, he soon will be because he's hitting that age. We still had to process that loss. I talk about it in my stand-up. It's like, yeah, I, I, I'm mad he did what he did. I'm not saying he didn't deserve what he got because of what he did. But I'm, I still have a right to mourn him. The Cosby show it was on my house, on our TV all the time. And I had Cosby's records. I loved Cosby as a kid. I loved the Cosby show. And that was a little bit of a loss, you know, because this is somebody who you've believed was a certain way. And and now he's ripped from existence as we formerly knew him. You know, this isn't like Prince changing his name to the artist formerly known as Prince. This isn't that type of this is somebody being completely ripped from us because who we thought they were, they no longer are. I think you have a right to mourn that. And how do you do it? Honestly, I think by just watching their body of work. And with Cosby, that was human bodies. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> that fucking guy. That became what he's known for now. And that's so unfortunate. It's almost better to die. Someone like Bob Saget. He was just, I met him a couple times. I worked with him once and he just was an amazing man. He was pure kindness and pure joy and it didn't seem contrived. It didn't seem like he was placating or being like a sycophant. He just was this genuinely jovial, affable, loving human. And when I met him, I was nervous because in my mind, I'm like, this is like Bob Saget. I've looked up to him for so long. And you guys know I fucking love Full House. Danny Tanner, that was my second dad. And the second he started talking, all of that went away. He made me feel so comfortable and made me feel like I was loved. And this is a man that I barely knew. And I had just recently worked with him this past fall. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I had that experience. And even though it was short, it gave me all the insight into who he was. And, and when he passed away just recently, it was again, verified and validated in the outpour of love that he received after he passed away from all the different people he's worked with and the different lives that he's touched. Everyone said the same thing about him, that he just was the kindest most loving man ever. And I had called my friend Jeff Ross to talk to him and tell him I love him because I knew how close he was with Bob. Him and Bob are very, very tight and I'm friends with Jeff. And Jeff called me the day my mom died. And, you know, we, we, we keep, we keep up with each other. And I, I was just so sad for him and I had missed his call. And then he called me back and I was like, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm in the car with John Mayer going to pick up Bob's car at the airport. And then the next day, that was all the news. And one article <laughs> said <laughs> that John Mayer drove in a car to go pick up Bob Saget's car with Bob Ross. Yeah, the they called him Bob Ross, not Jeff Ross. And my assistant caught that. Debbie was like, look, they, this newspaper called him Bob Ross. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that, but that was pretty fucking funny. And I think that's the way you can process it is to watch, watch what they were in, watch their movies, watch their shows, read what other people who you, who you follow, who, you know, um, posted about Bob, read their tributes to him. I've been doing that. Jeff Ross has posted a bunch of amazing photos and has written such beautiful things underneath them. And, you know, as somebody who's lost two of the most pivotal people in my life, I, I can empathize with people who've lost loved ones. I know what that feels like. And this was definitely a human that was so revered by his peers. And I had no idea because I didn't know him like that. But to see the outpouring of love, just it filled my soul. It made me it made me realize that you can live a life filled with love. You can live from a place of love and 
and look how much of an impact that can have. All these people that I was going to say Bob Ross has touched, <laughs> Bob Saget has reached just from being this lovable man. And it really is a testament to living from a, vul a place of vulnerability. It takes a real level of vulnerability to live from a place of love. Because to live from that place, you have to trust that you're going to land and that no one's going to take advantage of you. And that even if they do, that you're still going to be okay. And to a lot of people, it might seem like too much of a risk. The, you know, the squeeze isn't worth the juice. But I think in this instance, we're being proven it is. It's a pure example of how powerful of an impact you can have when you live from a place of love. And I think Bob Saget was a testament to that. And so I'm so sorry to his wife, um, Kelly Rizzo, and to his family and his full house family and his daughters and everybody else who loved him, sending you guys love. And, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever spoken about people other than my parents passing like this. There's been a few pivotal comedians and actors and actresses that have passed that have been important to me. I don't know if I've ever spoke to, to that effect after their passing, but because I had this conversation with Jeff and I was such a huge fan of Full House growing up and I had actually worked with Bob, I felt like I wanted to say something about it because I know a lot of other people die and people are always, it's like this death auction. Well, you got to talk about, did you know that this basketball player also died? You got to mention the basketball player. What about this person? Then I, the whole podcast is just a fucking hour long obituary. Um, let's see. We got a couple more here. Kaya 89. Did you like Stevie Weeby's toy butt? I was on the fighter and the king, the, the bee and the sting, the boy and the toy podcast. And Stevie Weeby brought his fuck butt. If you don't know what a fuck butt is, there it is. It's that thing that you, um, you, you put your peony in. Yeah. You put your peony in that. That's for, that's for faithful pilots and people who live in their mom's basement. That's what that's there for. And, uh, Stevie Weeby brought it on the show and it was alarming. It was an alarming thing they kept slapping it and it was in, in, in comf uncomfortable and also intriguing and now it makes me kind of want to sell my butt <laughs> can you imagine jesse may's fuck butt buy one get one free i might have to do that for valentine's day would you guys buy my fuck butt <laughs> it's so gross i couldn't do that my dad's dead and i still couldn't do it that's too i my dad didn't raise me that way but maybe i'll make one Maybe I'll just make one. If you if you make a mold of your butt and you sell it, is that considered prostitution? Anywho, let's see. We got a couple other questions here. Friendly neighborhood heathen, want to let me buy you lunch sometime? I think that this was from before. I think I said yeah, but no. I don't know if I answered to you. You know, we got we're we're work associates, Josh. And you might just be like, bitch, I'm not trying to bone you. I I'll give you a fuck butt. How about that? Is that a happy middle ground? <laughs> Would that be a happy middle ground for you? And you won the ooze pipe. I think you won this, didn't you? Right here. This is coming to you. You probably already get it by the time this podcast airs, but we did a couple ooze giveaways on our weeds day, which you guys make sure you check out on Instagram every Wednesday. We raise awareness and charity for Alzheimer's and we're doing some giveaways this month and uh, you guys watch out for that on my Instagram page. We go live on Wednesday nights. Um, let's see. Nicole 1031. When it comes to your team, how do you communicate what you want and expect? I, they could tell you, I probably drive them nuts. Debbie, especially my assistant. I DM her on Instagram. I send her pics on Instagram and videos and I screen grab shit. Her favorite thing is when I take a picture of something and I point, I, <laughs> I'll take a picture of something and <laughs> my finger will be in the photo. Like, this is what I want done. This is what I mean. And she's like, bitch, what are you doing? 
Are you like from the 1800s? Will you just take a picture of the thing? Stop putting your finger in there like a crazy witch. I communicate through Instagram, through text messages, voice notes, voice mails birds, homing pigeons. I, I write messages in the sky. I, I put notes in a bottle. I put messages in a bottle. You name it. That's how I communicate. And I probably drive them nuts. But here's the thing, Rudy, my producer and um, M D Michelle, my marketing partner and Debbie and everybody who's on my team, my tour manager, over communicating is my way of making sure that they know how I feel and what I want and what I expect. And I'd be interested to see what people think about working with me. We should probably interview Deb and see what she says, what type of boss I am. I try to be, treat my team like equals because we all are equals. We're working towards a common goal, but I also have high standards. So I have to maintain how I want things done in order for the product to be something that I'm proud of. And sometimes it takes delegating and delegating can be hard. We're emotional creatures and especially, you know, women, we're emotional and it's, and it sometimes can be a difficult communication, um, attempted at communication because of that fact alone. And it's important, I think, to understand that the people you're working with are human beings and they have busy lives too. And they have other things that are important. They have other um, projects that they're working on and priorities. So I think that the easiest way to communicate is to not over communicate, probably what I do, but to communicate clearly and to communicate from a place of love and be like, hey, we're both working towards this thing. I definitely get frustrated sometimes because everyone's busy, but I think communicating respectfully and treating them like they are also a human with a life is is the surefire way to get and maintain respect and to get things done and to go towards that common goal as a team. And I think we've really nailed it so far. I'm really proud of of the people I work with now and, and what we're putting out. And I hope you guys are too. Honestly, I hope you guys are too. Um, let's see a couple more questions here. These are from also a Saturday, I think we posted this. Um, let's see. A couple of these already got answered. Um, oh, we answered this. Uh, Casey dreams for B BDR. Casey dreams for BDR. I don't know what that means. Can I lick your feet for $1,000? Um, it's kind of a low price. Honestly, because first of all, there's still an uptick in whatever's going around. So I'm going to have to risk being in a personal proximity to you so that I'm putting myself at risk. Secondly, where's this happening? You know, because there's a travel cost that's going to be incurred. Thirdly, how do I know you're not going to murder me? So that's a costly risk as well. So I'm going to have to say that you could do that for $100,000. I think that's fair. Considering I get regular pedicures. Not bragging, but you should know. Jimmy Pacapow. Pacapow, have you been streaking? Hell yeah, bro. What are you talking about if I've been streaking? Do you listen to this podcast? Hell yeah. I'd be streaking much more if we weren't in such a civilized society. That's why sometimes I feel like I want to live on a commune so I could just run in the field with my tits out, wild and free. Like God and the universe made me just like a wild horse just galloping down the beach with my titties out. And I've done that on a horse. So I know what it feels like and I want more of it. Yeah. Streaking is amazing. I think it's a great time. I think it's, it's what can reconnect you with your youth running around before any, everything sexualized, you know, now I, when I was a baby, I could run around. Everyone thought it was cute. Now I'm in the grocery store with my tits out and I'm a pervert. It's just not fair. Let's see what else we got. The Golden Retriever Freak. Why won't you come to Cleveland? I was in Cleveland last year, fool. Where the fuck were you? I was at Hilarities. Pickwick and Frolic. Where the fuck were you? I love that club. I love Cleveland. I've been there many times. It's a great time. You're going to have to catch me again. I was there a couple years ago. I'm sure I'll be back in the fall. 
Um, I'm on tour with Carly. We're going to be on tour through May, April, May, June. That sounds about right. And then September, October, November. So you guys will be able to ca- catch us on the road and our podcast girl will be available one of those nights as well. Um, the spring tour is available online now. You can go to jessiemay.com forward slash tour. You probably already heard it, heard it in the intro notes. Um, let's see what else. Dirty hippie heretic. Could I insert a THC suppository in you using my th- tongue? Wow. Wow. That's a very specific question. Thank you for your question. Um, I think it's good for the class to know that that's an option and maybe a couple people who have a stagnant relationship could implement that into their sexual repertoire, inserting a THC suppository inside your loved one using your tongue. We got to make things more fun and we have to remember that like the application process can be so clinical of things. Why not make it fun? This guy's got a great idea. Why not make it fun? You know, instead of putting your socks on with your hand, make your guy do it with his mouth. Well, maybe that's a little gross because socks are like, there's like fabric and you're getting the fabric. Well, he, how about he takes your bra off with his mouth? I think he should just do everything with his mouth. I think that's the theme that we're going for, but dirty hippie, not on me. Absolutely not. Unless you're a rich thicky, unless you're a rat. That's what I'm naming my guys. Rats, rich and thick singles rats come to my shows. If you've got rats in your life, bring them to the show, Rich and Thick Singles. That's the only prerequisite I have, uh, and bring it on. Please do not slide into my DMs unless you have, um, you know, at least a six-figure job. I I need, actually, you know, I I need you to be a millionaire. I need you to be not a millionaire, but a millionaire. Um, No, And it's not even for you to take care of me financially. I just don't want you to be a fucking slob. And not that all rich people are great and upstanding citizens. There's a lot of really good, really nice poor people. But sometimes those people turn into rich people. And that when you become that, you can call me. Okay. How about that? How about them apples? Let's see. Do we have a couple more questions here? Okay, here we go. Matt Curtis, what's the nerdiest thing you do? I think my morning routine is pretty nerdy. It's pretty consistent. I've done it every day for quite some time now. And I'll tell you what I do in the morning. And you can deduce if I'm a nerd because of it. Um, I wake up, I meditate, I journal. And then I make my tea. (laughs) I do crosswords. That's where it gets really nerdy. I do crosswords in Italian practice in the morning. And then I work out and that takes me, you know, that takes me a couple hours to do every morning. And when I don't get that done, it it makes me very frustrated. When I don't get that done, it makes me very, very, very fucking frustrated. But I just have to be kind with myself and realize it's a process and not everything's perfect. But I think the nerdiest thing I do is probably also podcasting. I mean, just the subject matter alone, anywhere from farts to the universe and we go deep on it you know i think anytime you sort of divulge into a topic and and get deep on it is is a nerdy thing but also i think the fact that i love horror movies so much and i've got such a vast knowledge of horror cinema makes me a total fucking nerd i love horror i love to be scared and most bitches it's not like we love to be scared we just want to know what to do when shit goes down and a lot of these horror movies you can learn from You know, you got to make sure your shoes are tied. You got to make sure you got sneakers in the car. You got to make sure that you have your phone, an extra phone charger and that you don't go where the noise is. You know, um, watching horror movies isn't for entertainment. Women are watching it for research. (laughs) But yeah, I think one of the nerdiest things I do is constantly watch horror movies with, you know, the same observation that somebody who studies animals has out in the field you know i'm I'm like the steve Irwin of horror r.i.p oh too soon huh guys Mm. i think this question was asked before but i like to answer it again how about that because a couple of these are all mixed in um leggy blonde what helps you get inspired to create it's a really good question 
because there's so many avenues to be creative in and there's so many ways to create something even thinking about birth and the creation of life to creating a painting or a work of art or a song and everyone's process is so different and I was just talking about this on my Patreon episode we've started to post episodes back on Patreon so you guys can get over there and check it out I have a part one and part two part one and part two with Shane Moss and um we get in deep on creativity and we get in deep on drugs and creativity. And I was saying to him, you know, when I think about the great music and even really great restaurants and fashion, all these things in in the art world, most of it, a, a big chunk of it wouldn't be here without some drugs. And I'm not saying that drugs are the best answer to being inspired to create something. But for me, in these moments when I'm podcasting or when I'm on stage, that's not necessarily my creative space. That's my performance space. The creative space doesn't always happen when you're creating. In fact, I think the most abundant space of creativity happens when you're separate from creating. I think it happens when you're in a space away from your normal processes. It happens when you're in nature. I think one of the best things to get inspired to create for me is nature. And sometimes you need to bring nature to you. And that's, you know, where daddy joint comes in. That's where daddy dank makes a visit. And I'd say two of my favorite things to do are to smoke weed or to enjoy edibles and go into nature, go on a hike. Those those together, especially through the process of losing my parents, but more so through just a general desire of living a life filled with well-being, I'll get stoned and go on hikes all the time for the fuck of it. And through that, I think of amazing things, or at least things I think are amazing, and solve problems. And it's an, it's a it's a really curious thing that happens when you allow your mind to wander. And I've spoken about this before, but I think boredom is a commodity that we have forgotten the importance of. And, and boredom today is associated with a lack of productivity. But in fact, it actually can help you be more productive. Boredom allows your mind a reprieve. And I think in those moments where we have reprieves and breaks and stillness and calm is where a lot of the answers come. I think in those moments of silence is where the most is created and it's allowing it's in allowing your mind and your soul to have a breath. Do you start to realize things that were stressing you out solutions for, and you start to hum a tune or you visualize whatever building you're about to create, um, a blueprint for. I think in those quiet moments is where we really, really tap into a creative space that is like no other. I don't think any other office space or performance space or gym can even come close to providing those types of results from. I think just from having done floats you know the uh, gr zero gravity and sensory deprivation tanks not zero gravity floating up in the air but uh, sensory deprivation tanks where you take away all your sound and your feeling and the water is the same as your body temperature and it's completely salinated to the point where you're floating I've had experiences with that where it has opened my mind in a way that it's almost like you <sighs> Like, oh, allow your mind like a deep breath. You ever get to a space where you're sitting down or you're reading or, I don't know, you, you lay down and after watching TV for a while and you do this, where you let out like a really deep breath or just a different type of breath that is more of a release than it is breathing. It's more of you getting deeper into a relaxation than it is you respirating. I think the same thing happens to your brain when you're in a quiet space, whether it be a meditative or sensory deprivation tank. I think you allow your brain to breathe. And in that breath is an abundance of creativity. 
And in that breath is a real space for you to figure out answers and solutions to things that you stress about. It's almost when you stop thinking about something, do you find the answer? It's in the, in the stop, in the, in the process of not thinking about it, do you think about it in the most, in the most possible best way? I think that sentence somewhat made sense. It's in the not thinking where you're thinking and your solutions arrive to you. And I know that for myself and in this society, especially this American society, it's such a go, 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 win, 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 fight. I'll sleep when I'm dead mentality. And we wonder why we're having heart attacks at 55. We wonder why we're dropping dead early. And we wonder why we're riddled with disease. Think about the word disease, dis-ease. Your body is uneasy. <clears throat> a lot of that disease comes from stress. And a lot of stress comes from doing too much. I know probably probably a lot of you listening right now are listening to this while you're doing 10 other things. Some of you might have the luxury to sit and just listen to this. But when you keep piling stuff on, it causes stress. And that stress accumulates in your brain and it can cause all sorts of problems. Stress has been linked to all sorts of neurodegenerative diseases, even Alzheimer's. And so we're in the society where it's like, go, 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 fight, 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 win, win, win. And have this, you know, Goggins mentality. I'm not saying it doesn't work and I'm not saying you can't be productive from that space, but there is a downside to it. There's a downside to not respecting the stillness and the calmness because every, every one of us needs sleep. Sleep is when we really do the most healing, regenerating, cleansing, and um, productive functions ever. Sleep is the most important thing. Yeah, we sleep a third of your life. Yeah, a third. So you can have two other thirds to live. That's how exhausting it is to live. You know, we focus on the fact that we're sleeping a third. What about the fact that we're living two thirds? And, and what that does to us. So I think in the society, it's really hard to uh, adopt the idea that stillness should be instilled more in schools, in offices, at home, as a part of the regular curriculum. And, you know, productivity for a lot of these places, it's been proven. You know, I, I think it was in, I forget which country did it or what, I think it was Google maybe or a company did it, I was reading recently, where they um, cut the work week down to like, I don't know, maybe a third less than what it normally was. And production went up 40%. And it was a really, it's a testament to what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's proven that if you find some stillness, you can create more. And it's hard to imagine that because of the type of society we live in, the go-getter society. But don't be afraid of allowing yourself some time to just sit and be still. Because in the stillness, some answers are going to arise and you'd be surprised at what comes up when you give yourself a break. You'd be surprised at the revelations and epiphanies you have when you honor your mind and your body and your soul and you give yourself a moment of pause. You really will be surprised at, at what reveals itself. And, and I hope that... <clears throat> Some of you have time to do that. I hope you guys try that in your own time to just, even if it's five minutes, don't overload yourself if you can't. I know a lot of you are moms and dads and single parents and working night shifts and all of that. So don't, don't overdo it. Just try five minutes and, and see what happens. And I, I promise you that you'll start to change the way you think and you'll start to appreciate things in a different, from a different perspective. So I hope you guys take that much at least away from this week's episode. And like I said, we're going to start posting interviews, interview episodes of Sharp Tongue Podcast on the Patreon, back on the Patreon now that mama's back in full effect. Dr. Peluso's feeling good. I appreciate you guys. Don't forget, we're going to switch um, when you can post your questions. It's going to be on the weekends now because more of you have responded in the weekends and it's just easier to get it done. And we're going to be also um, available on Instagram on Mondays as well. But the, check out for Saturdays and Mondays for questions. And if you guys don't have them answered on my 
Instagram, it will be answered on the podcast. I can't get to everybody because there's so many of you out there who need advice from an uncertified doctor. <laughs> but I will get to as many of you as I can. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.